Namaste. So this is a talk on the psychological causes of illness. What it means is that apart from the physical causes that scientists are very busy discovering, there is a ground in which illnesses thrive. Meaning thereby that if we provide a ground, the seeds of illness will grow. And if the ground is not uh, suitable for illness, but the ground is suitable for health, even when illnesses come, they will not thrive. So this is one part. Second is, there are actual psychological causes of physical illness. So one is that there are forces of illness which enter and the psychological being provides a ground. Second is that there are psychological causes of physical illness. So, for instance, there are formations, there are fears which can materialize because they have an impact upon the body. And it's very true that as we think, as we feel, so does our body begins to react. Will is the switch. Thought is the wire. So, as is our will, if I will that, you know, oh my God, this is a terrible illness. So, my body has got a message that I have to die because it cannot prove the mind is the leader. Mana prana sharira nita. So, if the body tries to fight also, it has to fight against the central will. The mains have given a message, main switch. This is dangerous, I am going to die. So it's very important to ensure that the will is right in the right direction. And along with the will, the thoughts are the currents through which the will flows and enters into the body. So thought is the current which carries the messages to each and every part. So that's why there is a very good uh, method of using thought and imagery for curing. Because by concentrating thought and Imagining beautifully something like a cure at, a, at any spot, we can heal it and help it to recover. There are no magics. Magics can take place, but uh, uh, we shouldn't expect impossible magics that now I have given a thought and tomorrow I'll be cured. It may, it's possible. Everything is possible. But at the same time, we should persist and persevere because there are certain things in the body which continue to throw up illness again and again. So that takes us to the next level. So second is psychological causes of illness and third is psychological causes which continue or prolong an illness and sometimes lead to chronicity. So the reason for chronicity of illness is the subconscious memory which is there within us and in the cells. Once they react in a certain way and I know of someone here who literally... Um, was proving what the mother has said. She said that, you know, the memory brings back the problem. Now, in this particular individual, an ashram inmate long back, very fine person otherwise. But I remember that he told me one day, this date is coming. So I thought his birthday or something. He says, no, last three years, every year I meet with an accident on this day. So I... <laughs> It was very embarrassing. Now, you know, he is a very old ashram inmate, very nice human being. What shall I tell him? So, I told him, yes, mother has said it's better not to make these formations. So, he said, yes, but I have them. Now, not realizing it's a self-defeating cycle. And sure enough, he got an accident on that day. And this was unfortunately a fatal one. So, it's so important to clear and clean the mind. I am, you know, allergies very often. There are many other causes, psychological causes. But one of them is this habit. The body cells react, tumors, because of habit. They are scared and they have learned to multiply and multiply. So the mother says, you have to tell the cells, don't have to do that. Be quiet, be gentle. Be quiet, be, be in peace. So there is this habit which makes an illness chronic. And if we learn how to, if not undo the habit, we don't give it importance. One of the things that habit tends to, when we pay more attention, it begins to, you know, um, go into that process again and again. And with the body and the cells, it becomes uh, inbuilt with, because of the intervention of the physical mind and the material mind. Now, that is a different aspect, a little more technical. But essentially, habits. And then the mind has a power of amplifying and minimizing. So mind, how does it amplify? There is a little pain. Now in children, there is a little cut. 
So children will come very nicely and say, I have got a little cut, I have got a little injury. And they are smiling. Very often you will see. And you tell them, either half a paracetamol, I apply eutheria, they go back happy and they are fine. But a person comes with grown-up, adult, well-read, highly qualified person, who has done his master's in Google <laughs> University, who has done a lot of research on WhatsApp. He comes and says, I have a pain or I have a cut. So if I tell you apply eutheria or apply some cream, you will say, doctor, don't I need a tetanus? Yes, you need a tetanus. Better you take a tetanus <laughs> otherwise. Okay, you take a tetanus. After that, will it become a septic? Then, depending on the fear, so many things begin to play upon the mind. So mind amplifies. I know people who, and this in modern gen times, we must be very uh, clear. How this is like a world vortex or a whirlpool in which people are sucked. For instance, it's advocated. Every six months you get your blood tested. Of course, most people don't know that the test we do here, at least in Ashram, they are very inadequate. If you have to, that blood test means a package. Because you have to check for carcinogens, you have to check for potential, this thing. Now, it's okay, you may detect something very early. But for all you know, if you allowed nature's processes to take part, they would have destroyed many things in the natural course. So this tendency where a mind is frightened and all the time wanting six monthly blood tests, who knows if that fear is not precipitating. I know of people who were doing exercises, everything right as per the blue tick box and they had a heart attack. I know of one person. So he says, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I do this much exercise every day. Of course, he was overdoing the exercise. Again, overdoing anything is not good. And uh, then I asked a question, why are you doing all this? He said, yes, naturally, because I'm afraid. I don't want to get ill. So now, see, this is the message we are giving. Whereas it should be a natural state of health. For, we must take joy in what we are doing. Not as a fear. So fear is the number one uh, psychological cause of illnesses. Mother says you attract what you are afraid of. And this was recently seen in the corona. Say whatever people may say. And unfortunately we have not yet learned the lesson. And I don't think we learn the lesson till we ultimately are fully cornered. Still the fear and fear and this fear multiplies, cascades. It's not that corona didn't exist, it existed. There is a virus like that, flu viruses exist. Okay, there is a mutant strain, maybe a little more aggressive. But by being afraid, we have suddenly allowed it to cascade. If only we met the response, we gave the response of faith and quietude and peace, things would be so much better. But I am so surprised, even doctors in Shurabindu's community, so afraid, so full of fear. So while we have to take the precautions, by the way, the mother did not even talk about sanitizing the hands and people asked her. She said that, well, she gave the example of the people in India whom she saw, that, you know, they would drink water from <laughs> the uh, pond. Of course, we have grown up drinking water from the well. We didn't have a problem. It was an open well. Honestly, I mean, I, am, uh, I have survived. An open well, where so many people put their buckets, not without, after cleaning everything. So they used to pull the bucket, take it in a, and they brought it. Now, it's not that people didn't fall ill, they fell ill, they rebound, bounced back, and slowly their immune system became strong through the challenges. Now, this tendency is to control all the outer conditions is something like the gospel of Harinika Shop. So that's how I... Uh, the psychological causes. See, Haranikashup is a person who tries to control all the outer conditions of death. So he has asked a boon. Neither morning nor night nor uh, outside nor inside nor on ground nor in air nor by astra nor by shastra nor by human nor by uh, gods. I shouldn't die by any of these. So death will find a way. But Prahlad's way. So see, now this is fear, the other is faith. What is the way of Prahlad? He simply says, Hari, Hari, Hari. <laughs> Everywhere he sees Hari. So this is beautiful, of course, I love to recount this in, in the Vishnu Puran where 
when Prahlad is thrown off a cliff, he has an experience of Lord Vishnu saving him. One of the most beautiful descriptions. Holding him and putting him on the ground. It may sound like it is fantastic. Well, my first visit to Pondicherry, I had this experience. Slipping on the rocks. And literally mother holding me and putting me on the ground. So much so that I was experiencing bliss. While outwardly I should have had a cracked skull. I already have one, but not uh, the skull. <laughs> but, <laughs> well... It was so strange. And Dr. Maheshwari was a witness to this whole thing. So when we live with this idea that the divine is there in everything and he is there to protect us, this faith is the best remedy. And it was, it is inbuilt, given to a child. See, no child is anath. Child does not have that concept how I'll survive, what are the challenges. By faith, just like a little animal, there is an animal kind of faith. In a child, in human adults, it should become a conscious faith. But what it becomes is doubt, fear, mistrust. This may happen, that may happen, thanks to all the explosion of information. So, to live by faith is the best way to ward away most of the illnesses. Many times, like if I look back and you know how we have grown up in a typical village, now it will be difficult because now I am flooded with this information. Even if I want to keep away, it is there, it has come. But at a point of time, we lived, coexisted with even snakes around. We, it, we were not afraid, oh, a snake may come from. But today, if you tell me to live in a room where nearby there could be a snake, hundred things will come, <laughs> come into the mind. <laughs> I'll either call a snake charmer or pray to Shiva. <laughs> of course, we have a remedy which is the mother. So, it's so important to cultivate faith. Where there is faith, most of the illnesses will not find sufficient ground. Why? Because, see, there is a logic to it. Let me like put it in perspective so that it's not very unscientific thing. So, what does faith do? Faith cures. Mother has said, doctors talk about placebo effect. So, what happens with faith? Number one, just like fear attracts, faith automatically fills the cells with a hope and enthusiasm. With faith, we have given a message to the cells. You will be fine. That's all they want. You see, like little children, when little children come to parents, what do they want from a parent? Not lecture. Not at all. They just want a little encouragement. Yeah, yeah, well done. Go ahead, he'll do. Yeah, that's it. That little fellow is gone and he's enjoying life. Why? Because they just got that little dose. Just a little hug. Yeah, I'm happy. The child goes. So when we are in that state of faith, it gives a message to the cells that all is well. So they operate according to those dynamics. But fear gives an opposite message. Similarly, another thing which is very important is the role of thoughts and feelings. It's well known that anybody who wants to lead a life which is not only healthy but happy is to master the thought. And very simple methods. Let's say sometime that life is overwhelming. We are feeling unhappy. We are in sackcloths. That time we should remind ourselves. Why am I wasting time in all this? As I said, depression is an idle man's uh, pastime. <laughs> so to get up and that will to conquer, this should be always awakened. But for that, the will must be strong. It can be practiced in many ways. Simple things, when we go through life, life is not always very pleasant. It's not always uh, there to give us what we want. So we have to practice, cultivate the will, to be patient, to learn to endure, which is something which again I find unfortunately missing today. Because we are very impatient. Why? Because we order Swiggy and immediately food comes, instant delivery. We have everything which is available on a push button. This is a very dangerous thing. Why? Because we have become so impatient so impatient that we don't know how to learn to wait. And to learn to wait is so important in normal life, as well as in psychological life, in relationships. Wait, things will get mended. So, one will not wait unless one has a will that is patient, persevering, as well as there is a faith inside. So, 
it is important to keep the will and faith intact. A weak willed person easily succumbs to any kind of suggestion. He gets a suggestion from there, there is a big illness going on, and he is the first fellow to catch it. In fact, the mind can actually create symptoms, it is known. So, very often, I, I, this is my feeling, I can't say one has to do a study that very often uh, there are symptoms, actual symptoms, but the test may not show. So people often say that this is all uh, probably, you know, test may not show, but you have a problem. I'm not sure whether the mind is not actually, by that fear and formation, created a illness. So it's so important to get rid of, keep, stay away from all these formations. And therefore, stay away from the company of very serious doctors. You know, very risky. Because illness, illness, illness is going on in their mind. There are some very good doctors. And I can understand that, you know, whole day doctor's life is illness-centered. Unfortunately, not health-centered. And it's uh, also very unfortunate that, you know, the whole medical training gives us constant messages about illness. When I went to the medical school, I hardly knew just few illnesses. And I thought I'll be treating sardi jukam and dysentery, diarrhea and all that. And then I realized there's so many illnesses. So I used to wonder where are these illnesses we have grown up never seen. But suddenly you realize that new illnesses are added. So the mind gets full and cluttered. And hospitals, unfortunately. That way we are very fortunate in the ashram that the ashram nursing home is truly a kind of healing space. You don't feel there that you, have, you are ill. You go there and rest and you know that space is so beautiful with mother's atmosphere across the sea. And the mother wanted it. She said, it's not a hospital or a nursing home. I want there to people go, rest and relax and get well. Rest she will do. But a space where we can just go and be there and be in quietude. And actually that's what the nursing home is. Even now, if you really look at it, uh, those who have the pariche of the nursing home. That's how it should be a healing space, not stinking with chloroform and everybody walking with all very serious faces and, you know, people are with this or that, you know, looking at them, you feel I have come to some, uh, you know, when people pass away, they wait in a place called limbo. Limbo is where you may be decide, you may go to paradise or you may go to hell, you don't know. So very often when I look at the waiting place, it looks like waiting in limbo where your fate will be decided and they are all waiting anxiously. The result will be out. After the doctor sees me, he will say, pass or fail. Very often he says 50-50. So you go back as confused as you were. So it's so important that, you know, places where we rest, relax, should be full of positive energy. Which means it should be surrounded by people where Everything is positive, especially those in the medical profession. It's important that we have an impact upon the patient, not only by the medicine we give, but by the looks we give, by the smile we give or do not give. There are many, when a person is in distress, he picks up the smallest signal. You may not be smiling because you didn't have a breakfast or had a fight with your wife. But the patient takes it as a judgment on his illness. The doctor didn't smile. I must be serious. He may be lost in his own <laughs> issues. So it's so important to understand that a state of cheerfulness, a general cheerfulness is very important for recovery. And if we can't be cheerful, we know that famous story, Norman Cousins, Anatomy of an Illness. If you don't know how to be cheerful spontaneously, there are some people whom cheerfulness comes naturally because they spend life energy readily. They don't bottle it up inside. But if we don't, read something which can make us cheerful. Read some nice, healthy, uh, no, not that, uh, what was that, English, uh, which, which became bestseller later on. Not Peter Seller. P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, okay, nice. Decent. <laughs> still. So something like that, or maybe a nice little light-hearted uh, show, or just sit together Something, not that you have to laugh. Cheerfulness is simply a state in which we are full of, um, we are not anxious. We know that things will be fine. Why? Because there is grace. So cheerfulness is not only the salt of sadhana, 
It is the sap of life, if I may say. So, ananda is the sap of life and its experience is cheerfulness. So, if we can't be, also again, here company is so important. So, cheerfulness is another important element and its opposite, gloom, depression, anxiety, excitement, anger, kam, kama, krodha, lobha, moha, mad, matsar, jealousy. All these are very strong, like heady emotions, worse than alcohol. Okay, both are bad. <laughs> You should not be like, okay, I can take a call. Interpretations. Jealousy is something which cuts the very deepest, inmost fabric. People burn with jealousy, literally. It's a very bad fire to be roasted in. So don't eat. And look at it. Who is getting roasted? You are getting roasted. It makes no tad difference to anyone. <laughs> so ultimately, okay, if you have a problem with somebody, okay, you can't manage, be away. But don't get roasted in jealousy. Similarly with ambition, type your personality. Little bit ambition is okay in normal life. I am not saying it's something healthy. Because work should not be done for... Ambition means I want to reach that point. Or ambition means that I want in the eyes of others relative to somebody else I want to achieve. Obviously it's a wrong tra track. But... To do work for the joy of it. To excel because it's a worship. I must do my work well, very well. In fact, very, very well. But it has nothing to do with getting praise or acclaim or getting a position. Thankfully, in the ashram, there is no such thing. People still eye on a position. That's a different. But there are very few. <laughs> so, and even if you become head of department, you realize it's not nothing worth it. It's only a crown of thorns. So, people are <laughs> that way. <laughs> Most unhappy people. So in a way, this is something very nice that mother has removed all this. She said, I give work, I don't give positions. Do your work, do it well. And it makes no difference because there is nobody working under you. You have a position but nobody under you. So everybody is doing their own work. Everybody is answerable to the divine. So this of course is an ideal world. But even in outer life, instead of working to get a claim, name, fame, money, one should work for the joy of it. It's an expression of our being. But wherever there is this ambition, wherever there is anxiety, what does anxiety do? It puts our nervous system on a constant asthirta, fatigue, depression. Depression cuts holes. And anxiety and excitement, it makes our nervous system on a restless mode. Even excitement, even a happy excitement, so-called happy. So when there is lot of asthirta on even so-called happiness, it again makes the nervous system unstable. So if you are having a boat party, you may be very happy dancing, but you are still making the boat unsteady and it may well drown. So either which way, be steady. It's good to be happy. But there is a difference between being happy and being over exuberant and throwing energy and you know, just uh, wasting it like anything. So we, sh we should be careful of where we are wasting energy. Gossips and all these things. They sap us away and then we fall ill. So it's good to exercise certain degree of sanyama on nature. So these are some of the things, tendencies. As I said, fear, sadness, depression is very dark because depression clouds everything and even when the sun is there, it cannot shine forth. So what is the remedy of depression? Go out in nature, see a flower, take a good walk, meet a friend who, who is in good cheer. Of course, best is to offer it all to the divine. Do an activity which gives you natural joy. But don't brood over it. What, that part is very clear. Don't sit in sackcloths and start listening to Mukesh songs and you know all the... Ye dunya, bhot, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Whatever the world is, mm -hmm. your depression is not going to make it better. It's only going to make it darker. And if the world is bad, the right response should be, let's make it better. Even if individually or collectively, whatever little we can contribute. If the world is bad and if we say, oh, it is so bad, it is only magnifying it. So it's important to avoid depression, agitation, excitement and most importantly, fear. And the best way is to cultivate their opposites, to maintain psychological health. So cultivate their opposites, gratitude, cheerfulness, compassion, generosity. 
in place of jealousies, anger, peace, quietude. Shantam, Shantam, Shantam. Peace is the great, great remedy. So these are just some of the aspects of psychological causes of illness and what we should cultivate. Most importantly, faith. Faith in the divine. Kalyan Shraddha, that whatever door we may have to go through, life will not never be a cakewalk for anyone. We have to go through certain things. So we have to go through certain things. What is there to make such a big fuss about it? Go through it pleasantly. You are being, going through it with unhappiness, cursing, complaining, grumbling, as Mother says, it opens the door to all kinds of forces. You have to go through it. What you have to go through it? Go through it happily and cheerfully with faith in the divine. So faith in the divine is the ultimately the biggest rock of safety against all attacks by adverse forces. It doesn't mean one will not fall ill. One may fall ill. But even when one falls ill, one goes through singing a song because one has learned to detach the mind and the mind is put elsewhere and the mother says it's a great capacity. There are people who even when they are physically ill know how to detach the mind. And that makes a very big difference rather than letting the mind run over onto the illness. At least detach the mind. Illness is in the body. At least keep the mind free from it. Namaste.